Uh, so we normally get really informal in the summer. And with the recent heat, uh, summer's come a little early. Uh, that's why uh, I'm not investments. Although it's not quite as hot in here as I had feared. Uh, but the informal period of time for Christ Church is only two weeks away anyway. So just so you know, that's why we're dressed so informally. So this passage in the Gospel of John comes from a section that is frequently called the Farewell Discourse, where Jesus is giving final words of encouragement and instruction to his disciples before Jesus heads to Jerusalem to be crucified. Well, he's already in Jerusalem, but heads to his arrest and crucifixion. And this is the section where Jesus, you know, as we just read, those who love me do what I say. You know, they, they follow my words. This is the section where Jesus gives his command, a new command I give you to love one another as I have loved you. So when we read that Jesus is going to send the Holy Spirit and then he says, my peace I leave with you, my own peace I give you, what is that? What, what peace are we talking about? And how does that peace, how can that peace become a part of our lives? Now, I grew up in the renewal movement. And back in the renewal movement, I think the answer would be, oh, the peace comes when the Holy Spirit fills your life. And I think that there are moments when the this, this Spirit comes upon us and we have that sense of peace, but it's fleeting there might be moments in your own prayer life and nothing to do with renewal or the spirit. You're just worshiping and you feel a sense of peace. But it isn't like there undergirding your life. It's just fleeting and momentary. Jesus had a peace that it seems to me just followed him in his whole life. I mean, even in the, the moments of stress, until the very last moment when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, when I think it's genuinely plausible that Jesus was really, really frightened. Up until then, there was this peace that just followed him wherever he went. And I think in the context of the farewell discourses, we can assume then that if we are going to have the peace of Christ, we need to look at the life of Jesus and ask, well, what was it about him? What was it that he did or how was it that he thought that gave him a sense of peace. And I think there are several things to say. I'm going to talk about his conviction, his devotion, his determination, his attention, and adoration. And I'm going to unpack each of those. So let's start with conviction. Jesus' peace came from conviction. The principle here is a conviction in who you are. I need to know who I am. Now, Jesus knew who he was. There was no doubt in his mind about who he was. And in John's gospel in particular, there are seven times when Jesus uses the phrase, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in John's plot line, John is using these sayings of Jesus in his gospel to deliberately echo the word for God in the Old Testament, Yahweh. I am who I am. So when Jesus, is, Jesus says, I am the bread of life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that's what we should be hearing. Whoa, Jesus is saying something profound about who he is in terms of, of God. Jesus also said in, in John 18, 18, excuse me, John 8, 18, for example, I testify on my own behalf. In today's lingo, I think that would mean I don't depend on other people's opinion for my own validation. I don't need other people's approval in order to know who I am. So if you don't know that, if you haven't settled the question of identity in your own life, the thing is, is that there are plenty of people who will try to remake you in their own image. 
They'll try to shape you and push you into someone that you're not. And, of course, that never works. It, it never works as the one, you know, if you're the kind of person who wants to change someone, I hope you figured out that doesn't work. And if you're the kind of person who wants to, you know, please everybody, I hope you figured out that that doesn't work. You've got to figure out who you are and become at peace with that. Now, I'm not saying that you don't need to grow, that you don't need to change. I'm not saying that at all. But you need to come to terms with who you are in God in order to begin to walk this path, if you will, of peace in your life. Secondly, Jesus had a devotion. I think we could call this principle, a principle of dedication. What I'm getting at here is Jesus knew who he was trying to please. And he focused on just pleasing that person, right? And I have a sense you know who it is. In case you haven't figured out, you can't please everyone. You know, the moment you get crowd A happy, crowd B is upset. You know, you go from a hero to zero <laughs> in a nanosecond, all right? You can't please everybody. Can you imagine what it's like to be God? Even God can't please everybody. You know, on any given day, two people walk out of their house and the first one says, please don't let it rain today. And the other one comes out and says, oh, please make it rain today. And even God can't please everybody. What, a, what is God doing during the Celtics game? <laughs> when people, he's, he's wearing green. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I need some water after that one. Okay. But you kept my point. God can't please everyone. Jesus said, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. And in Luke, Jesus also said, no one can serve two masters. Pleasing one person also makes life a lot simpler, right? Jesus didn't stress out because he never let fear of rejection and need of approval motivate or dominate or manipulate his life. He knew who he was and who he was trying to please. So you need to ask yourself, who do you think you need to please in order to be happy? Because you may not ever please that person. So you, you got to understand who you are, know who you are, and you have to understand who you're pleasing. And the quickest way through to, to answer those two questions is to know whose you are. You are a child of God. And you are deeply loved by the king. And he's the only one that you're living to please. You might commit this to memory. Nobody can pressure you into being someone that you're not without your permission. Third, Jesus had peace because of determination. I think the principle here is prioritizing your life and knowing what it is you want to accomplish. Because just like you can't please everybody, you can't do everything. You don't have time to do everything. So you've got to know what you want to accomplish. Your life, our lives are guided by priorities or pressures. Think of priorities as the things that you believe God wants you to do and pressures as the things that everybody else thinks you ought to do. So you need to prioritize and put first the things that you believe God is calling you to do. I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that you're, the, the direction of your life is your choice. By setting priorities, you can avoid what other people have called, and I agree, the tyranny of the urgent, where you just get inundated with all kinds of urgent things and not pay attention to the things that you're supposed to accomplish. Consider this, John, uh, Jesus said in John 8, 14, I know where I came from and where I am going. And Jesus said in Luke, I must, proclaim, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also because that is why I was sent. You know, the next time you're doing some Bible study, you might consider doing a word study on the word must in the Gospels and just look up 
when that occurs and when Jesus says, I must, and what follows that. Another interesting word study would be to look up the word came. And Jesus says, I came to do what? And you understand, you'll find out that Jesus was determined, he was focused, he had priorities, he knew what he wanted to accomplish. And then next, the, the peace of Christ came from a discipline of attention. You know, once you know what you want to accomplish, you focus on that. Focus on what's important. So you know who you are, you know who you're trying to please, you know what you want to accomplish, and now you're focusing your attention on what's important. As they, as they say, you, you don't major in the minors. You're not distracted by trivia. I've learned from experience that if Satan can't get you to do wrong, he'll inundate you with all kinds of good things that you should do. And how do you prioritize those things? How can you focus on the things that are going to get you where you want to go to accomplish what you want to accomplish. Jesus was a master at attention. He was laser focused. Think about the, the, the temptation, right? Jesus is being tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And the first temptation is, ah, you know, just be a sideshow. Turn these stones into bread. Be a magician. That's kind of cool. Or how about ri be rich and powerful? If you fall down and worship me, I'll give you all this. Or, and then the next one is, why don't you spend your whole career proving that you're the Messiah? And you can start now by throwing yourself off the temple. And Jesus has none of it. None of it. And, and look, he doesn't even waste one moment of his life proving to people that he's the Messiah. Although they often ask him to. Who do you think you are? By whose authority do you do these things? And he always answers them with these kind of cryptic answers of, you know, look, hear what I'm saying and read between the lines. I know who I am. I know who I'm trying to please. I know what I want to accomplish, and I'm focused on doing it. You know, when it comes to focusing our lives, I'm reminded of something that my, my rector growing up said to me, uh, in the months before I left to go to seminary. I don't remember the context, but it, it's just stuck with me. He said, Ben, we always have time to do what we want to do. We do. And speaking of, of focus, I think that, and in and, and focusing our attention, I think the pandemic has really thrown our churches a curveball. And in the, the two years of being in lockdown and being away from church, we've, uh, many of us have filled our lives with other things. Understandably so. I, I've used many times the example of going to work out. I used to work out all the time, and I'm still trying to drag myself uh, back there. When, when I was visiting my son Nick at his uh, graduation from officer candidate school, uh, I was at dinner, and a friend of his was also there, uh, this friend was from his, uh, Nick's former base in Nashville. And I was, we got to talking about the pandemic and churches and I was just observing that, that the churches in the South, the, the people were still going to church. And, and hear me out, don't, don't jump to conclusions about what you, you hear next. So he said, well, we never stopped going to church. And, and I realized, regardless of whether we should or shouldn't go to the church, go to church, that's not my point. The point is, is that the unintended consequences of being away from church for so long is that we filled our lives with other things. And that the, the churches that kept worshiping, they, they just keep worshiping. Again, is, was it wrong for us to not worship? No, I'm not saying that. I'm pointing out the obvious. We're still trying to recover from that two-year period of, you know, losing the habit and being focused about going to church. We always have time to do what we want to do. And finally, adoration. This is the principle of, of making prayer and worship a habit in your life. Jesus did that. You know, it should be a habit in our lives. It, 
obviously, as I just said, it's, we've kind of fallen out of the habit. In the service of baptism, in the, in the baptismal covenant, which I think is our Pledge of Allegiance, there's a phrase in there It says, will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? And this is, this is what that means. You know, if, in the next iteration, if there's another iteration of the baptismal covenant, I might propose that it say something like, will you devote yourself to the study of scripture in small groups and devote yourself to corporate worship and daily devotion? Because worship and prayer are great stress relievers. They are. You need to have time to worship God in the company of other Christians. And at Christ Church, that's been our number one strength, is worship. I mean, worship and music, that's what I've heard for years and over, over 10 years. I've been here a lot, 11 years, 11 and a half years. And people have said that the worship at Christ Church is why I come. And it's the, the feeling of being together and worshiping together that makes this such a powerful place. We're energized by other people. But we also need time alone with Jesus as well. Luke tells us that Jesus often withdrew to quiet places to pray. Uh, the, the 17th century philosopher Blaise Pascal said that all of man's misfortune comes from one thing, which is not knowing how to sit quietly in a room. So, you know, when was the last time you sat for five minutes without a screen in front of you, or a TV, or a computer, or earbuds in your ear, and just spend it alone with God in prayer? This morning, I, because it was so warm, I walked out on my deck for the first time and just sat outside with nothing. Not even a cup of coffee. And it didn't take very long before my thoughts just turned to God and, and prayer. That's what happens when you spend time alone with him. So, I mean, I think these are the things that gave Jesus peace. And so the peace that Jesus gives is not some mystical, magical thing that he's just going to give us without us having to do anything. I think it's about putting our lives uh, to work in the sense of following Jesus' model of making uh, the disciplines of devotion, excuse me, of, of conviction, knowing who I am, and devotion, knowing what I'm trying to, who I'm trying to please, determination, knowing what I want to accomplish, attention, focusing on what's important, and adoration, making prayer and worship a habit. These are the things that Jesus did and gave him peace, and they're the things that give us peace as well, if only we adopt those devotions in our lives. Amen.